Welcome back. Oh, so okay. <laughs> no, 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 bye, bye. Go, go, go. Welcome back to episode 60 of Blurred Summits. Today we are going to be talking about how to be more efficient. We're going to run through five different tips about how you can implement greater efficiency into your lives. So Matt, start us off with tip number one. So they're not really tips, they're habits. So oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> and so, so we have, we have, we have uh, six habits for you guys today. And they're just like, if you can get these into your daily lives, if you can, you know, be more habitual with them, you'll be, you'll, you'll see yourself being more efficient. So I'd say the first one is kind of the biggest one. And it's also the hardest one to do. But once you can get regular at this, it's, it's going to make everything so much easier. So the first one is to enter into a flow state. And what flow is, is this, you know, like whenever, you know, Abdul, I'm sure you've experienced this, like whenever you kind of like get into the zone you know it has different words it has like runner's high being in the zone you know it comes by many names but it's mm. the idea of when you're doing something you're just so in the zone you're just so focused you know like you're just putting studying putting out notes and like hours go by and you don't even notice right yeah and the so other kinda, thing the other sorry yeah. the other thing that's cool about flow state is that it's you're not putting out bad work you're putting out your best work in it as well right exactly yeah yeah so I'll just quickly define it. Um, it's defined as a state in which people are so involved in an activity that nothing else seems to matter. The experience is so enjoyable that people will continue to do it even at a great cost for the sheer sake of doing it. Okay. Um, so this term flow state was, it was uh, coined in 1990. And uh, the reason why it was actually coined was because in, in around 1990, there was a bunch like things like X games and like these extreme sports were becoming super popular. Like mm. before this time, they weren't really, you know, in like journalism and like, uh, what's it called? Like, like journalists were getting into these extreme sports. Like before people were like, Oh, these guys are crazy. But now like these guys are getting some media attention. Mm -hmm. Right. And what's happening is these people are breaking records that no one's ever seen. Like people thought it was physically impossible to surf like a 20 foot wave. Right. Right. Or 25 foot wave and now you have people today like regularly surfing like 100 foot waves and so they say that the idea is that now people are able to focus at a much greater level like that's why we see progress like across everything right like with what it would be like uh mm -hmm. biology phys uh, physics like in all these fields it's because people are able to focus at such a level today that wasn't people didn't really think was possible before so i know that was kind of a bit of a tangent but like the idea is this is something that you can train yourself to do. And the way you can train yourself is like, the first thing is your environment has to be cleared away from any distractions. You know, like this is a super simple tip, but like if there's anything that is going to distract you, pull you away from your focus, you aren't going to be able to enter that flow for the, the long periods of time that you want to. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Flow, flow state is interesting because I don't know. I feel like for myself, at least, I don't, I can't predict when it's going to happen. Like there's just some times where I'll walk into like an exam and the entire exam is a blur. And I walk out of that exam, I'm like, oh my God, did I even write anything down on the piece of paper? Like I, I can't yeah. remember anything or when I'm driving and then I end up back home and I'm like, whoa, what the heck? I just blacked out for the past 15 minutes. I Hope I didn't kill someone while I was driving. And so <laughs> like the, I don't, is there a way that a person can predict when they're going to go into the flow state? Um, so there's, so you can kind of track your behavior and see like what things, like for example, that test environment, it's, there's literally no distractions, right? Like it's you and the test, mm -hmm. right? Like you can choose, choose to not focus, but like you're taking the active step to focus, right? On that test. And so like the first thing, like the biggest thing is to clear away. And people say that sounds are like the biggest distraction. You know, if there's like a constant, like, you know, branch that's hitting your window, that's a constant distraction. Right. Mm. Also, uh, we're going to talk about some more steps later on that kind of, uh, I mean, more habits that kind of help with it. Um, but yeah, there's, uh, I remember there's a, there's an author by the name of Stephen Kotler and he wrote this book called the art of the impossible. And, you know, he was talking about how all these things were once impossible and people are now breaking these records, right? And so he, as a writer, he, he was saying for him, mm. flow, the way he gets himself into flow is by 
um, he has something called a feedback buddy or an immediate feedback buddy. Like when it works with writing, for example, you know, you have an editor, editor tells you to make some edits, right? And you go make those edits, right? But those editors, they're not like with you. They're not holding your hand all the way, right? They mm-hmm. can only read your book like every three months or what, right? Like they can. And so if you only rely on your editor, then you're only working when your editor tells you to, right? But what he does is he has someone that he's hired, right? <laughs> but somebody that he's hired that is going to basically tell him like he, that he's always constantly reading his stuff and he's constantly giving him immediate feedback, right? And he's, it's not like super long feedback. It's like feedback that this is all I need to get going. Mm-hmm. Like, oh, you were too, like this was too, uh, like you used too many personal examples here, right? Uh, add, add a bit more research-based stuff, right? And so basically, if you can figure out a system for you to get just the minimum feedback that you need, to get yourself going, right? With whether okay. it be, right? So if it's with studying, for example, right? If you can just make your checklist, right? Checking off things on your checklist is your minimum input that you need, right? To get mm. yourself going. So it's basically eliminate the the thing that's stopping you because sometimes we end up working in circles. We feel like we're not really in the flow, that kind of stuff because we we don't know what step to take. So if you get an outside source that tells you, okay, just do this step, this is your first step, this is where you should start, then you can more easily access that flow state. Exactly, or like an, accountabil- an accountability buddy, right? A partner, right? Someone to, or studying together for a test, right? These kind of things can help you get into flow. And, um, so as long as you have not someone telling you what to do, but more just kind of pushing you in the right direction and you kind of getting yourself to work. Mm-hmm. So yeah. is, um, can the flow state be practiced? Yeah, it can be practiced, right? Like if, uh, as I in, as in, probably- if I do more practice, I will more easily be able to enter into flow. Yeah. So like the more times that you enter into flow, it's easier to get your, cause you're training your brain into into working hmm. right uh or into into getting into the zone um i there's also like an exercise that they say to do and stephen kotler is the one that that said he does this uh he does meditation training actually okay and so he does box breathing and what that is is it's like imagine a square right so you inhale for five seconds then you uh, hold it for five then exhale for five then hold it for five right and the reason why he does this is when he's holding it for five seconds and like every time you do it for five, then the next time you go for six, then the next time you go for six, seven, like those four edges. Mm. And the reason why he does this is when you're holding your breath, you're, you're training your brain into going to like fight or flight to, to do uh, like practice immediate responses. Right. Okay. To, to, to practice that immediate decision, make like it's panicking. Right. So if you can kind of like, he skis a lot, you know, it's like, Kind of, if you put yourself into high intensity places, it's easier to enter that flow because your brain, it's easy, your brain is faster making decisions. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, that's right. Because when you are in a fight or flight decision, you're not particularly making those decisions. Those decisions are just happening, right? Exactly. So if, if you put yourself when it's low stakes, you know, you're not going down a mountain skiing. But when it's low stakes and you put yourself in those environments, then um, you can perform it better in real life. Exactly. Like it's you're quicker at making decisions. It's just quicker to jump into things. And that's kind of the idea. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, just before we end off this habit, uh, just I found there's an interesting study I found about this. So McKenzie and Co. It's this uh, McKinsey and Co. It's this global consulting firm and they mm. do research on businesses. And uh, they did this research where they looked at someone who constantly goes into flow. Like it, they looked at executives, right? And they looked at the executives that go into flow and those who kind of, you know, react to their day. And the ones that go into flow are five times more efficient uh, as those who don't, right? Like as those who aren't able to, you know, just sit down, get work done. And that hmm. is because 
they've minimized those distractions there. So that just means you just have to go to work on Monday. Right. Yeah. And they're good for, they're good for the whole week. Like they're getting as much work done. And so that was something I found. Did they look into what particular things those people did to get into flow or was it just kind of, uh, there was like a lot of things, but I feel like we need to do another episode into like getting into mm, flow. Right. Uh, but yeah, there, there, there's a bunch of things that uh, they did. Uh, but they said like, for example, there's some companies, they have policies where all emails must be replied to within 15 minutes. Right. Mm. And that is horrible for, for flow. Right. right. That for flow is destroys flow because you're supposed to get rid of your distractions all of a sudden. It's just distraction after distraction because you're just constantly worrying about things. So it's like being able to, so like getting rid of these types of policies, right? If you're constantly checking your phone, it's the same thing. If you have your phone, it has like a ringtone, like even if your phone's in the other room, right? But, you know, you can still hear the notification beep, right? What's the point? Hmm. Right? Yeah, because you can't, it, it's like you need a bit of time to settle into flow, right? Mm -hmm. And if you have a distraction that's every five minutes, beep, 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 this is going on, this, your mind is in two different places at the same time. Well, you can never allow yourself enough time to enter into it, right? Like, yeah. it's impossible to train it if you don't, I, a lot, you know, it's a matter of putting in some of that time into getting into that flow. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, like, and the rest of the habits that we're going to talk about today, they ultimately add on to getting into flow. Mm. Um, so like, for example, the next one kind of leads really well into this and it's create a strict daily routine. Because if you're, if you have a strict, especially for your morning and your night, you know, you're, you, you can react during your day to whatever you need to do, right? You know, have different classes, whatever, uh, different responsibilities. But when it comes to your morning, if you can tell your brain that, you know, it's going to be hard for the first few weeks, but after like, let's say four weeks of having the same routine where whether it's some, when someone goes for a run, someone goes for a jog after having breakfast or whatever, right? as long as they have a routine, it's easier for their brain to get into flow because their brain's been trained to be more disciplined. Hmm. Right. So like, I remember, hearing an interview, I can't remember with who, who it was with, but he said like the biggest, he thinks that the biggest advantage that he had over other people was he trained himself to as soon as his eyes open to just get out of bed. Hmm. I mean, you know, cause a lot of us, you know, like we look at our phone where uh, we check our emails, check our notifications. Like when we wake up, yeah, yeah. that's like the worst thing you can do. All right. Because you're just prolonging the time in bed. Right. And so if you can figure out a different time to do that and have like a strict routine, Right. Because then you just jump. I Like the idea is to minim minimize distractions, just jump into things. Mm. Yeah. Matthew McConaughey uh, said one time he was like one of the biggest keys to his own success is he would call it bookends. He would bookend his days, you know, like bookends and like a shelf, mm -hmm. like to oh, keep okay. the books up. And so he was, he's like, okay, I always make sure to bookend my day. He does certain activities in the morning and he does certain activities at night. And he said, these are non-negotiable things, right? It doesn't matter if I'm on set. It doesn't matter if I'm writing a book, if I'm at home with my family, it doesn't matter what the situation is. I always bookend my days. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. That's, That's a pretty, pretty savage tip. Yeah. And, you know, it, the, the whole idea is that it reduces the amount of decisions that you need to make in the day. Mm. And it frees up that time that it's like, oh, am I going to have breakfast now or am I going to, you know, stay in bed or, you know, my, what am I going to do in the morning? If you can just minimize the amount of decisions you're making, you can use that power, like use that brain power to, to work on different things. Yeah. And also not relying on your willpower in the morning to make those decisions for you, right? Like if I know from the night before that I'm going to be doing this, then this, then this in my morning, then when the morning comes, I don't have to decide what order am I going to do these things in? Oh, what am I going to do with my day today? Right? You, you have all that stuff planned out already. So you can yeah. kind of go along for the ride when it comes. Yeah. And this kind of also leads into the next tip, which is it's going to be easier to do all these things if you surround yourself with 
other people who have like strict routines or are or you see as efficient people mm-hmm. right so if you if you're going to the gym in the morning you're surrounding yourself with people who are also you know early morning you know like people who go to the gym in the morning mm-hmm. right who like people who realize that you know it's better for them to go to the gym in the morning or if you're someone who goes for a run in the park right? you're going to see other runners right or if you're someone who goes and try get some work done at Starbucks you're going to see other people at Starbucks getting their work done mm. right so if you can you know it's sometimes it's really hard to study in our own rooms at home right but if you can put yourself in environments where you're seeing the people that are successful right you know libraries maybe there's a certain floor on the library where it's it's a quiet floor and only people like people are only there to get their work done right and so if you can surround yourself in an environment which uh has efficient people then you're bound to be more efficient because you're going to want to be like those people right and i i suppose maybe if you if you think that's not true then look at the opposite and you'll see how obviously true that is look at lazy people they're mm-hmm. very much surrounded by other lazy people um and people who don't have a morning schedule usually everyone around them doesn't have a morning schedule either so if you look at the opposite end of the spectrum you can realize how true that actually is so of course it's yeah. true in the other direction yeah and you know i'm sure you've seen that video of the guy that's like yelling he's like show me your friends and i'll show you your future right? oh like, yeah yeah right? so <laughs> those um, guys are so dramatic it's like, come on relax <laughs> buddy, guy, okay <laughs> the guy literally stopped the interview <laughs> just like said that like five times dude you know um there's this one thing and this person was like show me your friends and I'll predict how much money you have in your bank account. And I was like, I was like, what? There is no way that is true. I, that's like the biggest party trick ever. If he actually could do that, show me your oh, friends. Wow. And he was like, it's like, I'll tell you how much is in your bank account, like to the nearest, like hundred dollars or whatever. I was like, what? There's no way. Yeah. But that would be kind of <laughs> cool. Here's hundred dollars, bro. Dude, I don't know. I it's like, I don't have a hundred dollars. Yeah. But the idea is that like, it's going to ex- inspire you to get more done. Yeah. Right? Like when you're around people that are, you know, go-getters getting work done, it's gonna, you're going to be like, I can be like them. Mm. Right. Like I, I saw like this, um, I thought I saw this tweet and it said that the reason why strangers are more willing to help you or more willing to, kind of support you is because the people around you are like they can't believe the fact that you, they you had the same opportunities as them and they weren't able to accomplish what you were able to accomplish right whether mm. you started a business right and so or you know start a, a non-profit whatever right the reason why the people closest to you aren't gonna support you it's because they believe that they they can't believe that you were able to do something that they had they that they, that they themselves couldn't do Right. I remember, um, especially with fostering a sort of working environment, my particular favorite place to study back when the university was open <laughs> was <laughs> was on the sixth floor of the library, right? Yeah, yeah. Because it was only six floors high, but the yeah. first three floors, it was still a part of the library, but, you know, those first three floors were known as public spaces where people are talking with each other, people are hanging out, and that kind of stuff. So um, it doesn't matter if you think you're going to be a very hardworking person on those first three floors, because when you go there, you're not working, right? But yeah. then it's like four or five, and then six, I don't know, I just really like the environment of six, and I found myself, okay, whenever I entered into that environment, it was so much easier for me to enter into flow, right? It was impossible for me to enter into flow on the third floor, you know? Mm-hmm. But on the sixth floor, it was money. And, and and what would happen is that they closed down the top, the, the four, floor four, five, six later at night, and every time, without a doubt, whenever they would close it down and I would have to shift to the lower floors, I would be out of the university within 30 minutes, right? <laughs> because be, like I would quit. I would quit within yeah. within an hour of them closing down that sixth floor. I would quit. I wasn't able to enter yeah. into a flow. All of a sudden, I was hungry and I was tired. And <laughs> all of a sudden, I had all these problems that I didn't have 10 minutes before. And it really shows you how important that environment is. Exactly. And, you know, someone might ask, they might say, you know, I, 
you know, I'm on my, I'm like, I'm at home alone. You know, I can't really surround myself with other people or I don't have people in my life that are, you know, people who are efficient that I would describe as efficient. What can I do? Right. And, you know, we have the power of the internet with us. Right? Mm. You can watch YouTube videos of people who, you know, I got into med school and this is how I got into med school. Like, you know, like you have the people who are like, like really good students and they have YouTube channels telling people about their success and how they did it. Mm. Right. Or you have people on Twitch and they do like study with me live streams, right? And so the idea is if you can, even the content that you consume, if you can kind of make that, you know, not all of it, right? But when you're trying to get yourself to study, you know, maybe go find one of those study with me live streams. Try it out. You know, you might be super against yeah. it, but it might help out. And right? I think like what my environment because some people hated the sixth floor of the library they were like i can never study there properly i would always get distracted whatever whatever and you know i have a, i have a friend who works the best when they're sitting at their desk and their dogs have like a dog bed under their desk mm -hmm. and when their dogs would just be taking a nap under their desk with them <laughs> and that's when they would be working the best and so it just goes to show like i could never do that what the heck like you know, I have I have something under my foot, like you know, what am I gonna step on it or something? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> but so I would not be able to do that, but it works perfectly for them. So seeing what environment allows you to enter into the flow state, because there is an environment for everyone, it just might be different. Yeah. Like for me, bro, you know, I really like going to Starbucks. You know, Starbucks. And, <laughs> right. And so, you know, like for example, I just like like the ambience. And like I like it when I go alone. Like, yeah. I like, like, I like bringing friends with me, but like, I do a lot more work when I go alone. And the reason is like, I see all these other like freelancers or like people that are working on their own stuff, you know, and just doing their own work. And when you're in that environment, you know, you know, coffee's pretty good too. You know, when you're in that environment, you're just like everyone around you is just there to get work done or they're in a meeting with someone. Right? It's just more of a getting work done environment. Mm. Right. Like, for example, for me, like, Sixth Floor was kind of too dead. Like, it was too silent. Like, there was yeah. no, right? And so, for me, like, I just like the like the ambience of, like, the sounds that Starbucks has, right? It was just a, a nice, it was a nice vibe for me. And yeah. so, that's why I really like studying there. Also, they have free refills, if you didn't know. They have. <laughs> so, <laughs> free yeah, and right? it kind of, like, inspires you when you see other people working on their own project. It inspires you yeah. to get your work done, that kind of stuff. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, exactly. Right. Um. Also, one more way is like if you're on your own and, you know, you don't know who to look to, you know, read the books of people who are successful, right? Mm. Because when you're reading these books from these people, you're going to find yourself like, you know, they're going to be in your head. Like you might remember a quote from this person, right? So when you're actually reading the books, you're actually in the, in the company of those people, you know, like, and that's the beauty of, of reading books is, you know, somebody wrote something down, but, you know, it's their thoughts that they're writing down. Yeah. Like I'm talking about nonfiction, right? Yeah, like yeah. With nonfiction books. And so that's one way to surround yourself with the company of fiction people. Yeah, something that I used to do when I was really trying to focus on something is let's say I worked for an hour or two and I was real focused. Like I, I had a real good study session or a real good work session, whatever it might be. And it, I wanted to take a break and go eat lunch, but I didn't, I wanted to come back. Mm -hmm. I know that if I open up Netflix while I'm eating my lunch, while if back. I if I go on my <laughs> phone, if I do that, right, I'm not coming back. So what I used to do is that I used to read a book while I was eating lunch. And what I realized was that the the book, I didn't mind leaving it. You know, like some, sometimes you're done eating your food. It's hard to leave your phone. It's hard to leave Netflix. When I was reading that book, it was really easy for me to leave it. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I'm done, I was bro. like, I was like, okay, that was a quick lunch. Time to time to leave, right? Yeah. Because sometimes my work was more interesting than the book I was reading as well. So that it really helps to keep you on the same level of flow in that same mindset rather than withdrawing you and taking your mind so far away from flow with the more exciting activities. Yeah. And this next tip is one of my favorites or not, not tip habit. Right. And it's to get this habit of practicing gratitude. Okay. So, you know, when you're more, you know, when you're conscious of the things that you like, when you're more consciously grateful, it helps you be more meaning. Like it, it fills your life with more meaning and like it helps you live a more fulfilling life. Right. Because, 
you realize like, oh, I've been giving these things that other people haven't been given, right? Whether you believe mm. in God, a universe, or whatever you believe in, right? You know, the reality is you have things, you have advantages, you have blessings that other people don't have, right? And one of the greatest ways to show gratitude is by using the thing. Like, for example, Abdul, let's say, you know, I bought you a pair of shoes, right? And I never see you wear those shoes. You know, like, I, w- I wouldn't say it, but, like, in the back of my head, I'd be like, damn, bro, I bought this, this guy these these pair of ball shoes. Every time we play ball, this guy's never wearing them, right? Yeah. And Did so, you buy me ball shoes? I'm not going to answer. I was consciously trying to use an example that I do not But the point is, on the flip side of that, you know, I buy you ball shoes, and, you know, every time we're playing ball, you make the conscious decision that I'm going to wear those ball shoes because I'm grateful for the shoes that you got me, mm. right? It's going to make me feel better, right? Because it's like, oh, I didn't waste my money. Like, it's going to good use, mm. right? Or if someone buys you, you know, a certain, maybe someone buys you a backpack, right? You use that backpack, right? So the greatest way to show gratitude is to use the things that you've been given, right? So, you know, maybe you have been given an amazing voice, right? Mm. You know, try you know, try singing, right? Like, you know, right. do something with the thing that you've been given. Maybe you've been you're maybe you're an amazing writer, right? Particularly right. if those things are lessons too, right? Like for example, have has somebody ever told you like, oh, I remember one time they told me this, this fun fact. They told me this um life lesson that I sort of carry forward. It really shows that you're learning from this person and everybody loves to share the knowledge that they have so what better way to show gratitude than to show this person that hey i was listening to you and i actually did really embody the things that you were saying yeah dude i remember a friend of ours uh he told me like i can't remember what it was about but he was like well yeah you told me you told me to do this and i actually did it and it worked out and i was like i, I don't even remember giving him that advice bro. i'm not gonna lie yeah <laughs> <laughs> but the fact that you know the fact that it worked out you know, uh, like it's something I would have said, but I never remembered. Like, I didn't remember that conversation. Mm. Right. And uh, the fact that he it had such an impact on him, but it wasn't that impactful on me goes to show like, you know, the things that we are like think that are, are small, they might be huge to someone else. Mm. Yeah, for right? sure. And the big thing also with when we talk about gratitude, a lot of times it's like, okay, have gratitude in your head or in your heart or whatever. But it's also very important to make sure that you're expressing that gratitude whenever you possibly can. So just being grateful for things within yourself sometimes is not as good as if you have the opportunity to say thank you, to appreciate somebody else's work, to appreciate what you have um, and what was given to you from the different resources that are in your life to express that, right? Tell the person, hey, by the way, like, I really appreciate this piece of information that you told me. Yeah. And it doesn't even have to be something that they told you. Maybe it's something that you noticed and you were like, wow, this person is really good. Uh, Maybe this person is really well spoken. Or maybe Mm. this person, like, they're really good at writing, right? And so just, you know, maybe talk to them afterwards and be like, hey, I noticed that you were you know, you inspired me to be like focused on this trait in myself, right. To be more, you know, responsible or or whatever. Right. Maybe someone inspired you, you know, voice those things, right. That's some way, that's a way of being grateful, right. To literally tell the person who helped you out. Yeah, absolutely. I I agree hundred percent. So this next tip that you, uh, this next habit that we have is to be a sacrificing person. And what that means is you need to realize that, in order to achieve the things that you want, you're going to have to give certain things up, right? We all have the same 24 hours in a day, right? And let's say you want to make a change, right? You want to, you know, your grades have been lacking, let's say, and you want to be, you want to be a 4.0 student, right? Like you ask anybody, they're going to say, out. like you ask anybody, what grade do you want to get Abdul? You know, Abdul's going to say, I want a 4.0 GPA, mm-hmm. right? But, and every student's going to say, I want that. But not every single person is willing to sacrifice for it, you know? Like, yeah. not everyone's willing to give up their Sunday, for example. It's like, no, Sunday is my time, right? And so, you know, and maybe that's not what you really, truly want. Like, you, what you truly want is what you're willing to sacrifice for. You know, maybe you're okay with the 3.8, right? But if, if that means you have more time to spend, 
doing uh, with your social life, right? Or maybe you really don't want to give up your time at the gym. Maybe for you, like going to the gym two hours a day, like that's something that has to happen, right? Then maybe you have to, maybe something else has to go. Like something's got to give and you got to understand and be okay with giving certain things up. Yeah, like this, I was literally just talking to my friend about it the other day, but he he watched Daniel's podcast. We had Daniel mm-hmm. Jamal on as a guest and he introduced a very interesting idea, which was Newton's third law. And to sort of reiterate what he said, Newton's third law basically says that um, everything has an equal and opposite reaction, right? So every, or sorry, every action has an equal and opposite reaction. So the way that we can interpret this from a perspective in our own lives is that I need to give up some things in order to receive those things. So Mm -hmm. if you want, for example, a lot of worldly success in the traditional sense of money, well, uh, like status, power, whatever it might be, worldly success, what are you willing to give up in this world, right? So there needs to be things that you give up. And if the things that you're giving up are not equal to the things that you desire, then you'll never be able to get those things that you desire. So a real tough, you know, a lot of people, they say, oh, like my 20s are my time to live. I want to live in my 20s. Well, if you want to be successful, like somebody like Mark Zuckerberg or Elon Musk, those guys gave up their 20s, right? They gave those up in order to gain their type of success. Now, that doesn't mean that you have to, because like you mentioned, it depends on what you want. Not everyone wants to be Mark Zuckerberg or an Elon Musk, but are you willing to give up the things that they gave up in order to have the things that they have? If not, no problem. But you can't complain that they have it and you don't. Yeah. I remember Gary V. He's like, one of the things that pisses him off is people that say, oh, you're so fortunate, <laughs> right? Like, you're so lucky. And he's like, you know, I'm not lucky. It's just when you guys were partying, I was, right? Like, because he hears it a lot from the people that he grew up with, right? Or like mm. the people that he went to school with and, Again, it goes back to the people who are going to support you the most are the strangers because the people that you grew up with, the people that are around you, they're like, they can't believe that the level of success that you have due to the fact that they had the same opportunities, right? Yeah. And so, again, it's all about giving things up. Uh, this last habit that we have is to adopt a growth mindset, right? And a growth mindset, if you don't know, is, some, is basically to take, the biggest thing is to take your mistakes and to learn from them. Mm-hmm. Right. And to, to, to not hurt, put yourself down. Right. When something doesn't go well, you, t- you take what can you learn from that? How can you grow from this incident? Right. And because, you know, small changes, they add up over time and they add up after months and years. And this makes it so that you become hungry to learn and improve. Yeah. You know, truth be told, um, the growth mindset destroys a fixed mindset because with a growth mindset there is a potential that the fixed mindset lacks so the fixed mindset kind of just says the way that things are the way things always will be right i failed now means i'm always going to fail i can't change i can't get smarter i can't improve the growth mindset whether it's true or not i don't know right whether it's true or not let's say it's wrong But at least it gives you the inspiration of knowing there is a potential. There's a Mm -hmm. potential for me to change. There's a potential for me to be better. So even if it's wrong, shouldn't we adopt it because of the potential that it provides? Yeah. Like it makes you realize that you can be so much more. Absolutely. Yeah. And Um, I'm pretty sure I read a study that stated um, a correlation between achievement and performance flow and growth mindsets as well right usually a lot of athletes especially the high achieving ones um they are they can enter into flow a lot more easily and they also have growth mindsets so that's something to think about anyways thank you guys so much for tuning into today's episode about blurred summits if you found today's episode interesting think of one friend who could benefit from the information and be sure to share this podcast with them you can catch the full video podcast on youtube the full audio podcast is out on all platforms and be sure to follow us on instagram for more content thank you